All right, so uh, wish you all a uh, very good evening um, and wherever you're joining us from. In today's session, we are going to talk about one aspect of uh, GMAT prep, which usually gets ignored. Uh, when we uh, usually start, we don't really think about uh, building pace and mental stamina. But what you will realize is, as you get closer to the GMAT, this can be that one differentiating factor that can stand you know, between a 700 or a 760, or even a 650 and a 700 plus, right? So what we're gonna to do today is, uh, we're gonna look at uh, some basic uh, things that we need to look at. Uh, so no matter where you are in your prep journey, in case uh, you can let me know in the chat window, uh, how much of GMAT prep have you already done, right? Since uh, <clears throat> this session will be catering to all stages of prep. So if you are a very beginner, then also I will tell you how to build pace and mental stamina. If you are someone uh, who has uh, already started your prep, then also we have uh, some, some things that you need to keep in mind while you're practicing. And in case you are someone who has got the GMAT around the corner, and this is something that is worrying you, then again, we will have some tips on how to optimize your prep for the GMAT, right? So what we will do is uh, we will get started. Uh, first of all, just to introduce myself, my name is Arun Jagannathan. Um, and what I'm really bringing to you is my experience of having taught the GMAT uh, almost you know, for about two decades now. Uh, I have trained over 30,000 students. I have worked very uh, closely with uh, also uh, schools and uh, applicants. So after the GMAT journey, we also help them with the MB application process. So kind of have had a ringside view of both these aspects, right? So I have looked at it from both the GMAT perspective as well as an MB application perspective. And what I'm sharing with you is really my experience having worked with students who went on to do very well on the GMAT, right? So a lot of strategies that I'm going to share are really strategies that I have seen work on students, right? And uh, we also see that usually every year, the challenges remain, the, uh, remain common. So uh, those of you who are looking at some of the schools over here, if your dream schools are uh, listed over here, if you are someone who is wanting to apply to a top school with a great GMAT score, then you have come to the right place. I am going to be telling you the strategies for a higher GMAT score. And just before we get started, what I would like to do is maybe just be a little bit more mindful. Uh, today's session, I will be wrapping it up uh, in the next one hour. So by 10 o'clock, we will be done. Uh, but just take a couple of deep breaths to kind of center yourself. It is, I, I guarantee that I'm going to be adding a lot of value, right, uh, during the program, right, during the, the session. And, uh, you know, this, if, if you're starting with GMAT prep, remember that paying attention and being focused, listening to something which is on your screen is a key skill that you need to have. Right. So take today's session as an experiment of sorts to see how you are able to develop your uh, muscle to uh, you know retain your focus, retain your concentration. So <clears throat> what do we have in store today? Um, so we have. So I just see that there is Ayush Gupta, there is Mohit Vadva, uh, others also. If you could just let me know in the chat window where have you joined us from. Um, and uh, where in the GMAT prep you are. So that way it will help me tailor the content that I have in store for you. So the first thing that we're going to look at is why is building up pace and stamina so uh, critical on the GMAT? Um, we will also look at some case of uh, what happens if you do not have the right mental stamina, though you might have prepared for the test, you may have solved questions in isolation, but what happens if you do not have the requisite pace and stamina? We'll see what are the pitfalls of it. We will also try to see how to develop the right skills while we are studying for the GMAT. As I said, at any point in your prep, 
I will be breaking it up into three parts and we will deep dive into each part and see what are the things that we need in order to develop it uh, in each phase. And finally, I will also be talking about how we have helped students and maybe share some examples of uh, how uh, and, and you know even answer your queries uh, based on our experience of working with students with similar profiles, right? Uh, so I have Pranay from uh, New Delhi. I have Ayush from Indore, Vivek uh, from Delhi taking GMAT on the 21st. So great Vivek. So just please stay with me to the end. I have something uh, in store uh, for you as well. So why build up pace and mental stamina, right? Now, there are a few things that you need to remember as far as GMAT is concerned. Uh, as I said, in life, what happens is when we tend to look at GMAT, we tend to look at whether I can solve a question or not, right? That eventually becomes the, the you know, only thing that we see. But what you need to look at is you also need to look at the second part of it, which is, Apart from this, can I put it together in the three hour test, right? So that's long, how long the test is going to be, right? For three hours. So how do I keep my mind primed and working at the optimal capacity for those three hours? So first thing is on the GMAT, one needs to tackle decision fatigue. Now, what is decision fatigue? I don't know if you've heard of this, but uh, Mark Zuckerberg has just one type of hoodie. Uh, Steve Jobs had this black turtleneck. Uh, Barack Obama had the same colored suit. And the reason they said they wanted to have the same type of clothes is because in the morning when they wake up, they said we don't want to use our brain to even think about whether wearing that you know, uh, what to dress for the day, you know, the brain should not take up even that much space. Question to you, is your mental capacity or mental energy more than Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg or Barack Obama? Probably not, right? So what we have to understand is we all have finite mental energy. One example of this is uh, if you have ever met someone uh, at let's say 5.36 at the end of a long day at work, right? And someone comes and says, I have a quick question for you. You're like, well, it's a quick question, but really right now, you know, my brain is not working. So I'm pretty sure you have said that at work. The same thing may happen on the GMAT. So your finite mental energy has to be conserved. Otherwise, what happens, all the micro decisions, correct, will suck out the energy that you have. So it's very important that we conserve our mental energy. So I'll be telling you A, how to build that mental energy, but I will also say, uh, tell you how we can conserve it during the test. The second thing that you need to realize is, and I'm just looking at the chat window, so uh, Pranay also has the GMAT on 21st grade. Uh, Arai is from Bangkok. Uh, Ankush is from Bangalore, uh, taking it on 3rd June. Uh, great. So, so I hope, I hope today uh, I'm going to be able to help each one of you. Uh, the second thing is you might have realized that most of the things that we do, right? Uh, we probably do it for 10, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. So even if you're watching TV, right? So you may watch it for like 30, 40 minutes and then you take a break, right? You pause or you look around. So our brains in today's digital world is almost, you know, it's, it's very hard for us to focus for a long period of time. How many of you are facing this problem? Both the problems that I've stated, which is you feel that your mental energy gets exhausted. Second, you are not able to maintain the focus because, you know, you're constantly figuring out other things. So you're not able to stay. And, and a good example is a student once, uh, just, just a few days ago, uh, he said, Arun, I have, I have stopped reading. Right, because the moment I pick up a book, my phone just keeps beeping, and you know all these things happen, and I'm not able to keep the focus. Right, and the third thing that happens is if I don't manage my time, right? I have one hour roughly for verbal, an hour for quant, 62 minutes for quant, 65 minutes for verbal. If I don't manage and plan out my time, right? If I so think about it, the average time that you get in verbal is 108 seconds. The average time, or not the average, the exact time 
on uh, quant is two minutes, right? So that means you can't really afford to stretch it too much. Remember, so you have to be on the ball, right? You have to be constantly solving questions, moving ahead. Any point you end up getting stuck, it can spell disaster for you on the GMAT, right? So three problems, decision fatigue, attention deficit, time traps. What we will do is we will look at a case of a student, uh, you know, uh, who ended up taking the GMAT was very good in quant, right? He was able to, in isolation, he was able to solve questions. You give him a question in isolation, he'll be able to kind of do it in about uh, two, two and a half minutes and give you, right? But let us see what happened to him on the GMAT. So what I'm going to be sharing is his ESR. ESR is the enhanced score report that you get after you take the GMAT, right? So a lot of graphs over here. Let me just keep it very simple, just focus on the left hand side one, right? You see that overall on quantitative, he has scored a 44, uh, which is, which is you know, it may look oh, 44 out of 51, uh, but 44 is somewhere around the 50th percentile, right? So it's not a score with which you are going to score some hundred and above, right? Now let us see what happened, right? So you notice that GMAT has divided your test into four quartiles, correct? Now these four quartiles, right? Uh, have a specific number of questions, okay? Um, so let's take what happened. So in the first quartile, he's gotten 71% of questions right. In the second quartile, he has got 86% of the questions right. Okay, that means he's done very well. But then look what happens in the third and the fourth quartile. He barely managed to get you know, just two questions and, uh, you know, four questions right in the last quartile, two questions right in the third quartile, he got majority of them wrong, right? And I want you to look at the right-hand side figure, which is the time management part, average time per response, right? The first quartile, one minute, 47 seconds, great, right? Was able to maintain under two minutes, but look what happens in the second quartile, right? So in the first quartile, what has happened is a majority of the time was taken by incorrect questions, right? Which means that just the two or three questions that he got incorrect ended up sucking a lot of his time, right? And look at the second quartile, right? He has spent two minutes, 20, almost two and a half minutes per question. Yes, he has got 86% of them right, but two and a half minutes, right? And guess what happened? In the third quartile, he ended up panicking, ended up not just taking more time, which meant that in the last quartile, if you see, he has just managed one minute, 17 seconds per question, which means there is a good chance he probably guessed and blindly marked a bunch of questions, you know, series of questions. So what I wanted to show through this example was how someone may be good at want, but if he's not able to take care of simple things, he may end up getting into a time trap. Now, when we did the analysis, we realized that there were two things that happened in this case. The first thing, and I don't know how many of you relate to this, the first thing is the student was banking a lot on quant. He said, you know, I want to get a 15 quant so that my verbal, I'm able to make up for it, right? But in that stress that I have to get every question right on the GMAT, right? That is what has happened. If you look at the second quartile and even at the first quartile, he spent a lot of time trying to get even the wrong questions right, but more importantly, he spent more time than what was required. One uh, thing that I would like you to keep in mind is even for you to do well on the GMAT, even at 250, you can afford to make mistakes, right? So starting the GMAT with a mindset that I'm going to get 800 and get all the questions right is going to put a lot of stress on you, okay? So in this, uh, I have some tips a little later for you, which will tell us how to manage our time, how to make intelligent guesses, how to mark and move on, okay? The second is what I call as an ego issue, 
right? See, if you have spent a month, two months preparing for the GMAT, right? You have solved so many questions on algebra, right? For example, and you get this one question on algebra, what happens is deep down, we have this ego, which says, you know what? I have to get this question right. What happens? Take the scrap pad, start solving, and at some point you get stuck. What you do? Take a deep breath, say, you know what? Let me rub it out. Let me solve the question again. Right? So you already spent a minute, minute and a half. Now you are going back, looking at the data, trying to reformulate things. And before you realize, you spent four, five minutes on a question. Remember, I rather get a question wrong in 20 seconds than get it right in five minutes. Why? Because if I solve a question in five minutes, I have already damaged my genome. Right? So it's very important that we take these two things into consideration. A, the fact that we need to pace ourselves. B, the fact that we don't need to get stuck. Right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some tips, right? Today's session, I don't want to give you theory. I want to give you tips. These are tips that you can start uh, practicing from today, from as soon as you begin your prep, right? So the first is understand which stage of the GMAT prep you are at. Uh, so now that you see the various stages, maybe uh, you can let me know in the chat window how many of you are at stage one, how many of you are at stage two, and how many of you are at stage three. I clearly see uh, that uh, Pranay, Vivek, um, and uh, I think even uh, Ankush are on uh, stage three. Uh, Deepak from Ahmedabad uh, is also on stage three, right? In the optimization, you have already taken it or you have done significant amount of prep. You already have your GMAT date book. Uh, and by the way, if you let me know in the chat, I will be able to kind of get a sense of uh, where you are. Uh, many of you could also be currently studying for the GMAT in the sense you have uh, purchased a book or you are like, you know, solving questions from the OG or you are going to GMAT club and solving questions. You are currently actively working on GMAT prep, right? Again, guys, if you could give it to me in the chat window, it will help me uh, a lot so that I can kind of understand what stage you are in. And then you have, uh, you know, I, I've seen that uh, there are someone, uh, for example, Ayush, started your prep, you still have uh, four months ahead of you. So you're just starting to understand the GMAT prep, right? Uh, so thanks, Joseph, for letting me know. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, okay, so Joseph, Ankush, Ayush, so I'm getting stage one, stage two, stage three. But what I'm going to do, stage one is also important. And I'll tell you why orientation is important. So what happens is when people start studying for the GMAT, I think, and let me know if, if this has happened with you, um, you waste a lot of time thinking about preparing for the GMAT, right? We are not really preparing. I'm spending one, two hours just researching on GMAT. Just, you know, kind of figuring out the free resources and reading debriefs and spending time, you know, uh, and, and sometimes it can get very frustrating because my energy and my enthusiasm is the highest when I start my prep, correct? But if I'm going to get defocused, right, what will happen is without realizing I may end up spending the best part of my prep you know, meandering through various materials. So first things first, acquaint yourself with the GMAT. And this is one advice that I give to students who start their prep. And what I tell them is, take a test, take a full length test. You can uh, take a test, free test from mba.com, exam pack one. Don't worry about exhausting the test, okay? But take one full length test because what happens is you will understand what the real enemy is. So when you are preparing, when you're solving those sentence correction questions or critical reasoning questions, you know that, look, it is not an isolation that I need to solve, but I have to put it in context of the larger exam that I need to take. So taking a full end test at the beginning, and most students, when they do that, they get exhausted, right? Mentally, they get exhausted. They say, oh, you know, somewhere my brain stopped working and I just blindly click. No problem. You know what? You knew what the enemy is, right? So when you start to, you know, if you have a battle or a war, the first thing is to know the enemy, right? Acquaint the enemy. So taking a full end test, according to me, if you're starting your prep, is a great way for you to know what exactly the GMAT is testing. You will realize very soon that it's not about English or maths. It's not about uh, solving a question in isolation. 
The second thing that I would like you to do is before getting into the prep stage is understand the concept tested on the GMAT. GMAT is not the IAS exam. It is not a civil services exam where you have to buy heart a lot of things. Guys, let me get this very clear. The total amount of theory that is required for you to know, for you to know to do well on the GMAT is very finite, correct? It's very finite. So it means brushing up your concepts, right? Going back, figuring out the maths concepts that you might have uh, stopped, you know, maybe you, you need to go back and revisit them. Uh, when it comes to verbal, what really is getting tested on sentence correction? What are the rules? Uh, what are the types of questions in CR? What are the various passages? So getting yourself acquainted, knowing what is your strength and weakness is a very key part. And this will help you a lot at the later stages of the prep, right? And make sure that you may study for the GMAP, okay, into more of a habit. Now, what do I mean by habit? It's a routine, it's a ritual. Okay, it is something that you have to do every day, right? GMAT is not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? If you are a genius who can study for like one week and score a 760, congratulations, all, you know, uh, you know, all the best, you, you kind of uh, have nailed it. But if you are like a vast majority of GMAT test takers, right, you need to study for, you know, a, a fair period of time, right? Like three to four months. So if I were to study for three to four months and if I say, okay, let me just figure out how to study from tomorrow, that is not going to happen. Why? Because before you started your GMAT prep, you still had 24 hours in a day. You still had activities to do for 24 hours. Now suddenly you have the same 24 hours, you have the same activities, but now suddenly you have to take like a two hour chunk or a 90 minute chunk from your existing schedule and that becomes a problem. Most cases, people drop that prep because they are not able to sustain it. So here is the first thing that I would say, if you're trying to build your uh, you know, uh, uh, mental stamina, try to build it in your practice sessions. Each practice session, start with a very clear intention. Why am I doing this? Right? It may sound very facile, but honestly, we tend to forget. Why am I doing this? because I want to take the GMAT by June, July, August, whatever time, so that I'm able to apply in R1. Am I right? All of you looking at applying to R1, that is this year, right? So that you apply in R1 in September, October, so that you get your interview in November, so that you get your admission by December, so that by 2023, you join your program of choice, correct? So that is how the sequence is to. So why am I doing an MBA, correct? What is it that I want from my life and career? I think it is very important for us to constantly uh, remind ourselves that there is a larger journey that I have to go, right? The GMAT is just the start of it, right? In fact, if you go to a B school, what you will realize that all the skills that you're learning in your GMAT prep will help you not only during B school, but also in your life beyond B school. Now, if you have clarified your intention of why, right, uh, you also need to pick one place that you want to study every day. You know, picking your desk, picking your spot. I've seen students who just, you know, say that I, I can study anywhere and they will be, uh, you know, sitting on the sofa, watching TV and, you know, studying. Don't do that, right? So pick a place, make sure that place has the sanctity. You're constantly reminding yourself that I want to take the GMAT. This is the place, the moment I come here, I focus and study for it. Third thing, when do I study? Okay, here is a question for you. Um, it is uh, seven o'clock and uh, you have an option to watch Netflix or study for the GMAT, okay? So watch TV, watch Netflix, or study for the GMAT at 7 o'clock. Well, you may say, is it 7 a.m. or 7 p.m.? Okay, because in both the cases, the answer will change. Think about it, it's 7 a.m. in the morning. You have kept an alarm at 6.30, you've woken up, you've brushed your teeth, you're like, oh, fresh. Now we are sitting down. Will Netflix be a temptation for you at 7 a.m.? The answer is no. 
but think about it you have a whole day at work right or you are doing whatever you are doing and then you kind of uh, get done by 6:30 and then at 7 o'clock you have to motivate yourself to study then there is a more seductive option available which is to watch tv chances are at 7 pm you may choose to watch tv correct so i am a big believer that waking up a little early maybe you can make it a point to wake up half an hour earlier than what you are currently waking up right even that half an hour and then you can make it one hour and you know just try to uh, pace yourself but morning before the day gets started very important right so take out that 90 minutes 2 hours in the morning you can do it from 6 to 8 there are students who have you know who do it like 5 to 7 so it depends on you right it's okay if you do it 10 to 12 correct but typically do it before you get started with the day the fourth thing is start with intent if you do not know what you are going to be studying that study session is wasted right so before you study you need to have a plan today i am going to do sentence correction i am going to do parallelism in parallelism i am going to solve these questions from official guide there are 10 questions which will take me approximately 20 minutes to solve and another 30 minutes to analyze and a 10 minute break in between total 1 hour i am going to take right so if you have that level of clarity and that level of intention your motivation to solve those questions will happen by itself but if i'm going to start every session thinking what i need to study then half my energy gets invested figuring out what to do and then before i get started i get tired and you know things can of uh, go on right and also remember how much to study sometimes i have students who come and tell me arun i have uh, taken a break can i study 6 hours can i study 8 hours here is the honest truth i don't think you can study for the gmat in one setting in one single session you can study for about 2 hours right see gmat is a very brain intense work right it requires all the neurons in your brain to go on the synaptical surge to get to an answer correct so it's not possible it's, it's like uh, if i were to give you an analogy if you do something let us say uh, during college at least in india you have the submission right the journal submission and usually you will have people doing night out a day before the submission now why is it possible for me to uh, you know write a journal for 6 hours or 8 hours because it's a mindless activity i am not using my mind i am not processing information i am just doing stuff however if i am studying for the gmat each question for me to think for me to look at four wrong answer option pick the right answer option is going to suck a lot more energy so very important keep your study session uh, i would say start off with about an hour in fact you start with 30 minutes then build your stamina and go to about 2 hours okay so this is for people who have started their prep okay so that's really my advice for you which is ensure that you create a pattern the 2 hours investment that you put into studying for the gma will go a long way in your actual gma right to build your stamina okay <clears throat> now you get to improvement stage what happens in improvement stage is you have already kind of known the theory you know what the basics are you kind of have a concept you are able to solve some amount of easy questions but at this point what you are doing is you are investing maximum time practicing questions remember you are still not at a stage where you are taking tests you are at a stage where you are still practicing questions picking the right questions making sure that your study is kept to a 90 minute now why is it 90 minutes well you can make it an hour you can make it two hours doesn't matter i'm just thinking that 90 minutes is a good enough time for you to focus uh, at a stretch right and what is important is you solve questions with the right intent and purpose what do i mean by that remember none of the questions that you see during your practice will actually appear on the gma correct so it means it's pointless for you to solve it and memorize it so what is the intention behind solving any question what we are really doing is we are helping our brain 
kind of figure out the patterns. You know, we are looking at it and say, can you mimic what the right question looks like, right? Are you able to figure out the solution? Are you able to take a word problem, create a formula out of it, right? So when you're solving the questions, here is how I would suggest you do. First is between accuracy and speed, accuracy wins. And I'll tell you why. Accuracy is effectiveness. Speed is efficiency. Like for example, if you're driving a car, the first focus that you have is to drive the car properly so that you don't go crashing into people, right? Once you have figured out how to drive safely, then you optimize, then you try to go fast, then you try to take like fast turns, you do all of that, right? So when you are practicing, you are in practice mode. Think about cricket, right? So there is a match and then there is net practice. So right now you are at net practice. So when you're doing net practice, what makes sense is to have questions of the same type appear, okay? Why? Because you're really trying to build your muscle memory. Let's give, let, let's take an example. Let's say you're solving CR questions. It may make sense for you to pick, let's say only assumption based questions, correct? So find the assumption strength and weaken and you focus on your you know, ability to figure out what is the data, what is the conclusion, what is the glue that kind of connects them together. Having that orientation will help in, you know, uh, 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 kind of developing your, as I said, muscle memory, correct? Now students say, but Arun, on the GMAT to I get mixed back. Don't worry, I will tell you what to do when you get to a mixed back, right? But at this point, you are just trying to develop your core muscles. I'll give you an example. Let's, again, I'm giving you a lot of sporting analogy. So in case you have attended a sports camp, right? When you were in school, let us say you attended a badminton camp. What you will notice is that in the camp, one day they will keep only for surf. So the whole day they will teach you how to do surf till your arms ache. But the idea is, if you know how to serve in the math scenario, you will be able to serve. I mean, you will basically effortlessly do that without having to worry, correct? So uh, that's what I would say. In fact, uh, a good example is uh, if you see this uh, uh, movie, King Richard, right? It's about the father of Serena and Venus Williams, right? So he does not let them play professional. That means he's telling them, don't play the match. Just focus on your you know, game, right? So I think it's important at this stage for us to focus on the game, not on the match. If your game is perfected, if you know how to solve questions of a particular topic, trust me, on the GMAT, everything will come together, right? Now, the way I would suggest is, if you have, for example, uh, let's take what or verbal, on an average, you can take two minutes, okay? So let's say you solve a set of 10 questions in critical reasoning, okay? And you take about two minutes, which means for 10 questions, you are taking about 20 minutes, okay? Now, what I would like you to do is in any question that you think you need more time, stop, put a star, okay? Put a small asterisk and say, I will come back to this question, okay? So now you solve 10 questions. There will be a couple of questions on which you would have put the star or asterisk. What you do now, after 20 minutes, take infinite time, take as much time as you want, go back and look at all the questions and say, would I change my answer? Or if I have more time, right, would I be able to get to the right answer? Give yourself more time before looking at the solution. It's very important that you do so before looking at the solution, right? That means you're still looking at it and saying, I don't have a time pressure. Can I still solve this? Do I, am I effective, right? Do I have the competence to solve this question? Once you have done that, look at the solution, but don't look at the explanation. I'm going to say this again. First, you solve with time. Then you solve without time. Then you look at the solution, come back and say whether what you thought was right and try to see if you can explain why the right answer option is right and why the four answer options are not. That is a very, very important skill that you can, that you need to have. And then the fourth stage, go to GMAT club, find the solution, look at what the experts are saying. Correct? So very important that we kind of break it 
into these four parts. Uh, I think that may be a slight echo in the room because I had some furniture moved. So the room is kind of empty. So uh, I hope you're able to still hear, right? Um, okay. Um, all right. So I'm just looking at it. Uh, I have Meghna who has a question which says, please guide the people who are at the end of the prep or book. So I have uh, this, uh, because make, make we have other people also attending, so I'm just trying to say something for the benefit of all. And whatever I'm saying is something that even people who have booked the GMAT can take uh, over the next few weeks that you have, right? So all of this is still advice that is uh, uh, applicable. And finally, make an error log. Now, this is where I've seen that people make a mistake when they make an error log. When you are doing these practice sessions of 90 minutes each, what we tend to do is we tend to look at only questions that are right or questions that are wrong, right? We tend to bifurcate it. Ki either I got it right, it means I seem to know it, or I got it wrong, in which case I don't know anything. That is the wrong approach to have. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a simple way by which a question, whether it's right or wrong, still will give you something to analyze. The first is, if any question you are able to solve it in under two minutes, there is no confusion. Length is five, breadth is four, what is the area of rectangle? 20. Simple, right? I mean, this question you can ask at any time, I'll get it. Will I learn anything from this question? Nothing. What do I call it? I will say I named it, which means I don't need to go back and revise this question. Similarly, I could have gotten it wrong. But I did a very stupid mistake. I overlooked something. It said in the question, give me the number and figure in thousands. But I still went and picked the wrong answer option. I didn't read that. Or in sentence correction, there was a very blatant rule that I ended up missing. And I uh, went with something that I was not aware. These are all things that you can rectify. So though you got these questions wrong, still you don't learn a lot from such questions. right? So that's where uh, you know it's important that uh, uh, important that we kind of uh, keep that in mind, right? Now comes the third category, which is guessed it, right? Now what happens in guessed it is I was between the last two answer options, and while you are practicing, you can maybe keep uh, this between the last two answer options, right? I ended up picking one. Whether it's the right or the wrong answer option is different, but something confused you. Something about the wrong answer option looked right. Something about the right answer option looked wrong. What is the delta that you're missing? What is it that you're not able to figure out? That is where your learning will come. Now, many times I've had students who come and say, whenever I'm between the last two answer option, I always end up picking the wrong one, right? Now, this is a cognitive bias that we suffer. It's also called Murphy's law, right? So what happens is, uh, chances are, out of 100 questions, 50 between the last two answer options, 50 of them you got right, 50 of them you got wrong. What happens, many a time we looked at the ones that we got right, and we say, ah, this two I know. I, I wasn't confused between the last two, right? We tend to justify to ourselves that we would have gotten it right. So then what happens, we just look at the ones where we got it wrong because that pinches us, right? That pain we feel, hey, I was between the last two, I spent two minutes on this question, I still got it wrong. So we tend to remember the questions that we got wrong. That's a wrong approach, right? Whenever you're between the last two answer options, especially sentence correction, correct? Critical reasoning, those kind of questions. Go back, try to see what confused me. I might have gotten it right or wrong, but what confused me? The fourth one is timing issues, right? I got the question right, but I took way too much time. You know the ones that you have put a small asterisk on where you are not able to solve it in two minutes? Go back and ask yourself, okay? Now, there are two things that can happen. Yes, you could solve it faster. Maybe there is a shortcut. Maybe there is a strategy that you can apply. Or you could even think, maybe I could have guessed this question. Did I spend too much time? Was there a law of diminishing returns that kicked in beyond the two minute mark, right? If given such a question again on the GMAT, should I be investing those, that extra time or should I just make an educated guess and move on? 
This becomes crucial, especially towards the end when you are actually taking the jiva, right? To make to be aware of this during the practice. And the last one is, I just got stumped. I had no clue. I was between answer option B and C, right? The correct answer option turned out to be A. A was the first answer option I eliminated in in the first twenty seconds. What happened? You know, many times you would have probably seen this in uh, critical reasoning questions, right? You look at the answer and C, and then you say, "Wait a second, how can it be C? It's almost like..." But these are the questions from which you are going to learn the most. This is gold for you, right? Each question where you got completely stumped, take it, spend ten minutes, fifteen minutes trying to analyze. Was it a concept that I did not know, or? Was it something that uh, I was just not able to spot, right? So, what was the reason? Because that is where your biggest improvement is going to come on the gene. Okay, so please use this uh, while you are practicing, and this is where we were in the improvement. Now, I am going to get um, to the optimization phase. A lot of you were asking me about uh, the optimization bit. So, what I am going to do is I am going to answer your questions towards the end, but I am just going to wrap it up with the optimization. And then maybe come and answer your specific question. So if you do have questions, please stay with me for another ten minutes, and I'm going to make sure that I'll try to answer uh, your questions as well, right? That you put on chat. All right. So now, what is optimization phase? Orientation. You started your prep, as I told you, very important that you get your orientation right. You know what to study. You are practicing from official questions. You are developing the good habits of study. Then you get into the improvement phase where your focus is on building your strength of solving. You are building your competence of solving. Now you have to take all of it together and apply it onto the optimization phase. First, you have to now pick your battles wisely. What it means is at this stage, I would recommend solving tougher questions because those are the kind of questions. That you need to expose yourself with. If you have done the first two parts correctly, that means you are good with easy questions. Your core muscle is developed, right? So once your core muscle is developed, then you can go for advanced questions, intermediate and advanced questions, right? What are the resources for it? You can go to GMAT Club. You can just give the tag 700 plus questions, official questions from GMAT Prep. You get that, or There is a blue book, Advanced Questions, again published by GMAT. You can find it on India.com, which claims to have only the toughest questions, right? So there are about 300 questions, really tough, really challenges you. So my recommendation: pick a book like that. So assuming you are on the first two steps. Why am I saying this? Because harder questions will always take more time, correct? And here is the other thing that you could do: is you could mix up your practice in such a way that you are creating sectional tests. Of 31 questions for quant and 36 questions for verbal, right? So creating these sectional tests and working through sectional tests, you are not worried about scoring. You are not worried about uh, you know uh, any strategy. You are just building your mental capacity. So now what happens? If I have 31 questions in quant, I am going to take uh, about 62 minutes to solve. So just generally pick about 31 questions. Similarly, in verbal, pick about 36 questions, right? So now, what happens? Your prep sessions also get longer, right? So earlier you were studying for about an hour in the orientation, you went up to 90 minutes, but now you are going to two hours, um, and you may spend one hour solving a set of questions and the other hour just analyzing them, right? And here is the time when you also need to take full length tests, right? Full length tests. Along with AW and IR, why? Because now you have to get your pacing in place, correct? Right? You have to ensure that you are spreading out your, uh, you know, questions so that you are not exhausting time. That you are able to kind of go through the full one hour. Now, uh, for quant, the pacing becomes very easy, right? For quant, it is two minutes per question. So no matter what question you are on. Multiply by two. That is how much time you should have taken. So what I've heard from students is, Arun, in quant it becomes very easy because this multiplication by two just gives me a very clear idea of how much I should be doing. 
But what do I do when it comes to verbal? Because you know, this 108 seconds seems to be a very weird uh, average number for me to follow. On the GMAT, how do I uh, do it, right? So for those taking the GMAT, uh, here is a, a kind of a, this that I would suggest. As soon as you start the test, right? If you're taking it at home, you can use your physical whiteboard. If you're taking it at a center, use the scratch pad that they provide. And what you can do is you can give this and I'm just giving you a simple uh, way to divide your test. So what you do is instead of uh, thinking of the GMAT as one 65 minute test, because see, it's very hard for me to wrap my head around how to manage 65 minutes, right? At the end of 37 minutes, what should I do? I don't know, right? So it's easier if we think of the test as four 15 minute tests. Right? So your pacing really is for every 15 minute chunk, you need to solve nine questions, right? 15 minutes, you have to solve nine questions. Typically, that means you'll have a passage. So let's say you take about seven minutes for a passage, you solve uh, three questions, you have, uh, let's say, uh, another two questions in CR for which you take five minutes. So seven and five, 12 minutes. That means you have two more questions for SC for which you have only three minutes, which means you need to take 90 seconds for the two questions. Again, I'm just giving you a generalized thing, right? You can do the RC in six minutes, you can do the RC in eight minutes, you can do the CR in four minutes, six minutes. So, you know, you kind of have to figure out how much time do I need to give to each question. So on an average, remember the keyword over here is on an average, I'm spending 15 minutes for nine questions. Even during your practice, this is the pacing, right? Let's say you're running, correct? And you want to do uh, 10K in 30 minutes, correct? So if you want to do 10K in 30 minutes, that means you should do uh, 5K in 15 minutes, right? So you need to know how to pace yourself, correct? So that's the key over here. Now, one thing you will notice is that for the first nine questions, I'm actually giving you five minutes extra. Why? Because of the GMAT, we don't have 60, we have 65 minutes. We have five minutes extra. Why am I putting the five minutes in the first part of the test? Why am I saying that the first nine questions, you can take five more minutes? There are a couple of reasons behind it. The first reason is to know that the algorithm for the GMAT is going to reward you if you are able to maintain a higher accuracy in the initial set of questions. So without giving disproportionate time, Taking a little bit extra time in the first few questions is always helpful. Number two, a lot of times I've heard students that Arun, when I start my GMAT, there is a little bit of inertia in my mind. It takes me a little time to get my, you know, brain warmed up and, you know, uh, get my car moving. Well, great. You have an extra 500 buffer over that. And the third thing is if you think about it, if you want to guess, right, what is easier to guess? Question number three or question number 33? Very clearly question number 33, it is very easy for me to guess because I have only three more questions. I know how much time is left, so I will be able to do that intelligently. But at question number three, I have almost the entire test in front of me. The way our brain will try to justify is, you know what, I will take one extra minute somewhere over the next 30 odd questions, I will try to salvage that one minute. Right? So we also tend to be risk averse. We try to not guess as much at the start of the test. And that's the reason why I suggest you should have the five minute buffer at the start. So what you can do is on the GMAT, just um, you know, write down uh, this chart that you see as a pacing chart. And while you're going through the test, just ask yourself, am I in the range? Right? Which means, for example, uh, if you are in question number 18, Correct? And uh, you have 30 minutes left. You know you are on the right path. Correct? So this basically acts as a good, um, you know, kind of measure for you to know whether you are dividing your time and attention and energy throughout the test. All right? Um, so that's all I have on uh, the three stages. So I'm gonna just talk about, uh, as I said, I promised to keep it for about an hour, uh, but I'm just gonna talk about how Crackable can help you. So what you saw over there was, uh, you know, how we approach the test, 
right? So the first thing that we provide to everyone is a plan. See, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail, correct? Having that clarity, having that objectivity of what the GMAT is. And as practical, as I told you, we also do admission consulting. While you are studying for the GMAT, we also help you with your profile, right? What is your profile? What are the two or three things that you can do to improve your profile so that if you have the GMAT, you also know how to apply uh, to B school, correct? So that is the first part. The second part that you see is the prepare part. So what we have is we have uh, both an on-demand program as well as a live, uh, you know, video, live lecturing, group coaching program. So I'll just tell you how both of them work. In the, um, you know, in the video program as well as uh, in the group coaching program, what we do is we give you the most optimized learning path. What do I mean by that? Let's say you start with sentence correction. What we will do is we will just give you the topics that you need to study, followed by all the questions that you need to solve. Along with the course, we also provide an official copy of the, uh, a licensed copy of the official guide. I believe that knowing official questions are very important because think about it, these are past year retired GMAT papers, which means GMAT is going to test you on a pattern that is very similar to the questions that you find in the official document. For that reason, what we have done in the practice, what you see, we give you the OG questions, but we also have a video explanation which ties the theory. And this is, according to me, the biggest gap that I've seen uh, in students' prep. Because when I start solving questions in OG, somehow the theory that I learned seems to kind of go out of the window, right? So how do we connect the theory that we have learned onto actual GMAT questions, practice using, using actual GMAT questions? a very, very key part, which is where we have the practice. So getting you a plan, knowing what the direction is, giving you uh, exactly what you need for the GMAT, because you know all these years that I've been teaching the GMAT, very honestly, we kind of reverse engineered what really gets tested on the GMAT. So we don't teach maths and English, we just teach you stuff that works on the GMAT, right? That's really our, uh, you know, this thing. Is this something that GMAT is testing you or not? If it's not, then you don't need to worry about it, right? So that's what we have. Uh, and, uh, you know, just wanted to kind of say that uh, this is this is uh, something that you can find on the Trackable website. Uh, and, you know, I think there is a link that is being shared. So I'm going to go to the questions now. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I'm just going to look at the questions. Uh, the first question that I have is uh, Jyotish took the first mock after prep. I took close to three minutes uh, for each question. Hardly solved 21 questions in all, got 13 correct. What do I uh, do to increase my pace? So, Jyotish, my first question is what prep are you saying you did? I don't know what prep you did because whatever prep you did, one key thing is even while practicing, if you remember, I told you that you have to give yourself a mental cutoff, right? So maybe for 10 questions, you can take 25 minutes. That's okay. But even during practice, one muscle that we need to constantly keep exercising is, am I, see, if you're going to ask your brain, can I solve this question? Your brain will take it as an insult. It'll say, hey, I've got billions of neurons. I can solve this question for you. But if you ask your brain the right question, if you say, hey, can this be done in two minutes, you will realize a lot of times your brain will also be very honest with you and say, boss, just leave it because I don't think this concept, I know that well. Right? So having that focus on time throughout your practice, which is why I'm saying, you know, that whole improvement phase that we had in the middle. Right? That is the phase where you are developing your competence. And competence doesn't come with just knowing the answer. Competence also comes from knowing how to do it in under time, right? So Jyotis, as I told you, you could use the pacing, uh, the, the pacing chart that I explained. Uh, you could take this nine questions, uh, 15 minute timeline. And let us say you start and say, Arun, in 15 minutes, I'm able to solve only five questions. No problem. At least you know where you have started. So now what you say, 15 minutes, I should solve six questions. Then what will you do? 15 minutes, I have to solve seven questions. See, unless and until you work on that, all of it is not going to come together when you take the GMAT, right? So if you take another test, you will end up in a similar scenario. So before you take the next step, 
first work on your PC. Correct? I hope I was able to help you with that. Uh, I'm just looking at uh, Ayush. Ayush says, DS questions puzzle me, most especially inequalities when to opt option one or option two, only when to opt with other. So Ayush, let me tell you, if I were to tell you the totem pole of, you know, what people find difficult on the GMAT, correct? Data sufficiency involving inequalities, according to me, is one of the toughest things that you can get on the GMAT. And this is not me. In general, that's what students, you know, kind of face. It is tricky. So the first thing that I want you to decouple is my knowledge of the theory is not going to help me in solving this question. Correct? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a simple question. I'm putting it on the chat window. Uh, let me know if you want to solve this. It's a quick match question. 99% uh, of the fish in a pond are red. Okay, I just gave you the question in the chat window. Uh, while I'm taking other questions, I want you to think about it. 99% of the 200 fish in a pond are red. I want to make it 98% red fish. Instead of 99% red fish, how many red fish would I need to remove from the pond? Okay, so that's the question for you. Um, and, and hopefully uh, that gives you some food for thought. Um, okay, so Ayush also has a question on AWA, Ayush, here is my, uh, uh, you know, kind of quick point on that. That is Chinese burnt, if you, if you have your GMAT in, a, in, the, in the next few uh, days or so, there is one Chinese burnt. Uh, just look it up on GMAT Club. You Google for Chinese burnt AWA, you'll get a template. Just read up the thread, you're good to go, correct? So you don't need to worry. Um, Deepak, how to overcome verbal score plateau, sir? Tried hard and improved from V30 to V38, but stuck at V37, V38. Deepak, this is the place where most people end up getting stuck. So first things first, let us look at what are the three things that are required for you to do well on the GMAT. The first thing is you need to have conceptual clarity. If you have scored V37, V38, Deepak, I can tell you, you have conceptual clarity. Let no one fool you on that. That means you know your formulas. That means you know your theory. You know the sentence correction rules. The second thing that is required is application of those questions in the time that is given. By the way, uh, nobody has answered the question. So, okay, two, no, the answer is not two. Okay, because if I remove two, uh, I will have 196 divided by 198. Correct? I'll have 196 red fish in a pond with 198 total fish. So that is not your answer. That is not 98%. Think about it. So um, the thing about uh, you know verbal at 37, 38 is what may happen is there are some exceptions to the rule that you have to be aware of. Correct? So during application, just make sure, for example, uh, concept like ellipsis, concept like absolute phrases, absolute modifiers. Uh, concepts like uh, subject to mood, correct? So typically they will not get tested at a sub 40 level, but you will find many of these exceptions start getting tested. And the last thing, so conceptual clarity, application, and the third thing is really how well you are able to pace your uh, you know, time, right? So reading comprehension, for example, are you able to solve a passage and get the questions in eight minutes, right? A lot of times reading comprehension, students end up spending way too much time, right? Same thing with critical reason. So here at this point, sitting with an expert, trying to figure out where are you going wrong or you know what are the things that you can do to improve can definitely help you. But at this point, I would say the journey from 38 to 40, 42 is the toughest journey because each question you need to solve, analyze, see how you can get better. 
I wish I had a better answer, but really the 38 to 40, 42 is really the holy grail uh, that most people. By the way, guys, the answer is not two. I already told you why it cannot be two, because 196 by 198 is not 98%. Okay. Ah, I wish you got it right. 100. Why 100? Because you have 198. Okay. You remove 100. What are you left with? You are left with 198 in the numerator and 100 in the denominator. Correct? That's it. You have to remember that on the GMAT also, these are the kind of questions you're going to get at a 50, at a 51. Many a times what happens, we tend to look at these threads. I've seen some of them where they say calculate standard deviation. Boss, on the GMAT, you're never going to get that. The question which is going to take you three minutes. Chances are on the GMAT and a 50-51, the question that really troubles you is not troubling you because you don't know the theory. But somewhere, you know, data sufficiency that minus half I did not take, all in problem solving, you know, something I was not able to convert to an equation. Those are the things that will come back to bite you. So know your enemy. Well, I, as I said at the start, is going to be a, a important thing in terms of your GMAT. Uh, I got the um, last question. And uh, how do I go from 620 to 700? Uh, should I start from the absolute basics? Again, 620 is what? Around the 50th percentile, 50th, 55th percentile. What is 700? 90th percentile. So think about it. What is it that only 10% of test takers know? Think about it. At 700, you need to solve something only 10% of test takers know. Whereas at 620, 600, 620, you are solving something that 50% of test takers know. That delta 620 to 700 is really your improvement on optimization phase. See, as I told you, in our program, what we do is first, we have students go through the motions. Then at the end of the course, once you know what the theory is, once you have solved questions from OG, what we do, we give you a practice test. Based on your practice test, you get a mentor who's assigned to you. And that person really then plans out your optimization phase. The reason is optimization phase depends on a lot of things, right? It is not something that you can deduce only from data, right? Because data tells me where you were. Context tells me where you want to go. Many a times we know data, but we miss context. And that is where an experienced GMAT instructor can really help set the context, right? Based on the experience, based on your personal situation, okay? Um, and uh, should I start from absolute basics? You should start from absolute basics irrespective of whether you get 600 or 700, right? Like absolute basics is important. And it will take you maybe a few days to just get a hang of it, right? So the absolute basics is not the big deal. The actual deal is practicing, right? Because throughout your practice journey, what will happen every time you make a mistake, you are getting smarter. And I'm going to say this again. Every time you make a mistake, you get smarter. Why? Because you know what you don't need to. For example, if I were to have two students, let's say A and B, and I give both of them 100 questions, A has 60% accuracy, B has 40% accuracy. Okay? But now B goes back and solves each and every question again, analyzing each answer option and learning from it. Whereas A is very happy I got 60% accuracy. Now I give the same uh, two people another set of 100 questions. Who should I bet my money on, A or B? Guess what? I'll place my bet on B. Because I have a better chance that B is going to outperform A in the second trial of 100 questions. So that's what I want you to remember about data. That data is telling you post facto what happened in the past. Right? But the context of knowing what you need to do in the future is, is critical. Right? Uh, I'm just looking at it. So I guess uh, we are done with all the questions and uh, uh, a very, very, um, you know, uh, you know, a great session that I have today. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, you have the contact details in case uh, you want to get in touch with us, uh, in case there is anything that we can help you with. Um, these are, uh, you know, some of our contact details. Uh,
part. Thank you so much. Uh, and I hope this session was helpful. I hope you were able to take value out of it uh, for those who have the GMAT in the next uh, few days. All the very best. And for anyone else who has not booked the GMAT, all the best for your trip journey. All right. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you 